Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Gemma and I'm from IDP IELTS in Australia. We hope you're well wherever in the world you are today. In today's webinar, we're going to be busting some IELTS myths that you have asked us. So thank you to everyone who submitted a question on social media this week. We're going to answer as many as we can today. We've got a jam-packed hour ahead of us, so I'll hand over to you, Don. Thank you very much, Gemma. So as Gemma said, we're going to try and bust some myths today. And um, I wanna to talk to you about some of the things that people often think are true, but are not true about IELTS. In other words, they are myths. So let's start, let's dive straight into it and begin with this one. Many people think that you can't get a good score in IELTS writing. Maybe a band seven is about the best that you can get. Well, it's not true. But I can understand why people think this. Uh, because IELTS, academic writing especially, is difficult. Now, it's not made difficult because we're just cruel that we want to make your life miserable. No. The reason it's difficult is that it is the hardest thing to do. If I was learning Japanese, for example, I would have great difficulty in writing an essay in Japanese, but I could converse, I could talk to people, I could go to the shop, I could understand things that I was told. In other words, my reading and my listening, and to a degree, uh, my speaking would be well ahead of my writing. And that's exactly the case with English and with IELTS writing. I suggest if you're finding the writing difficult, go to our uh, public version of the assessment criteria and look at those very carefully because that will tell you in general terms what you have to do to succeed. And believe me, I know people who have got eights and nines in writing and English was not their first language. Let's go on to the next myth. Some people say that when you write an IELTS essay, it should be like the essay that you write for a university lecturer. In other words, it requires some, what we call rigor. It requires you to have a particular tone that you have to actually establish the truth of everything that you're saying. You can't rely on your personal experience. You have to refer to authorities. This is not true with IELTS. IELTS is a test of how well you can use English. And that's it. That means that you can use the word I, as evidence, as support for your argument. For example, you're saying that um, the traffic problems in big cities need to be fixed. And you can say, in my case, it takes me two hours to drive to work. That's perfectly okay. In fact, at the beginning of an IELTS academic or general training task two task, you are told to use, to support your argument with evidence from your own experience and from your own knowledge. And that means use the word I, and in my opinion, or I think. Okay, let's go on. A lot of people think that the use of personal examples, and I've just really answered this one, but if you'd use personal examples, that in some way is not as good as giving examples from newspapers or from academic research. Now, when you're, you're given 40 minutes to write an essay without any uh, resources, you really cannot rely on an expert. You can't say this was said by a doctor or well, this was said by a scientist. That means that we're not expecting you to say those things. 
I know some people write essays and they say, according to a survey in the New York Times, blah, blah, blah. That's okay. But I don't think the examiner really believes that that was, was true. So as I said, use personal examples. There's no problem with that. Okay, we go on. Some people are unhappy with the score that they get when they first receive their result, and that's okay. Of course, you're disappointed. You didn't get the result you wanted. You must remember that you are always able to ask for a remark. Now we call this an inquiry on results. And you go to your test center and you fill out the form or you fill out the form online and it costs a little bit of money, uh, not a lot of money, much less than the test. But if your score is changed, you will get that money back. Now people say, ah, oh, there's no point in doing that because the scores never go up. Well, that's not true. Scores do go up sometimes. And why is that? Well, if it's your writing, for example, two more examiners will look at your writing and they will not know your original score. And they will not know why you are asking for a remark. And neither of those examiners will know what the other examiner has given. That means it is completely objective. It is completely pure. There is no influence from their knowledge or their, from your past results or anything. Now in that situation, it can happen that those next two examiners who are senior examiners, very experienced examiners, may think, well, yes, this is uh, a seven rather than a 6.5 or an eight instead of a 7.5. That happens. And if that is the case, you will get their mark as your final mark. Now, sometimes, of course, they might think that really it's a five and you orig originally got a six. That doesn't happen very often. But if that did happen, you would keep the original band six. You would not go down. So please remember, you are always able to ask for a remark. Okay, let's go on to number five. If I smile and make my examiner laugh, I will get a better IELTS result in speaking. Well, there is no assessment criterion for humor, sadly because uh, it, we could actually, those funny people among us might actually get a very good score. The examiner is asked to make an assessment on four assessment criteria, and none of them talk about laughing or humor or anything like that. They're all about grammar. They're all about your use of words. They're all about your fluency. They're all about your pronunciation. Now, the examiner is a professional. The examiner is an experienced teacher who is able to make an assessment on these four criteria. It doesn't matter if you're laughing. It doesn't matter if you're frowning. It doesn't matter if you're crying because the examiner will stop and give you a tissue, right? That's, that's good. But really, all the other things, your body language, whether you laugh, whether you smile, none of that is taken into account. But I would add that the IELTS speaking test is a test where two people, two flesh and blood human beings are interacting in a perfectly natural, normal, human way. And when you do that, there will be laughter sometimes. You will make a joke. But if that's your purpose, then that's the wrong purpose. Your purpose should be to speak grammatically and correctly 
and fluently. And um, uh, by the way, if you do want to make a joke, make sure that it is grammatical. Make sure that you use words in a sophisticated way. And making a joke in a foreign language shows that you actually have a pretty sophisticated high level of that language. So it's okay to make a joke, but make it grammatical. Okay, number six. IELTS speaking is the most important section of the test. Well, it depends. There are different requirements for different people. If you are uh, requiring an IELTS score for a particular university, then sometimes a, that university department might say, we want an overall band 6.5 with no band under six. And they might ask for a higher score in one or other of the skills, usually writing or reading, not so much speaking. But that may be the case. I don't know. Your challenge, of course, is to inquire of the university and find out what are they requiring. But as a general rule, writing, reading, listening, and speaking have equal weight. Each of those is one quarter of your overall mark. So speaking is an equal part of the test to writing, reading, and listening. Okay, we've done six. Now we have a few more. IELTS reading seems to have become more difficult than it was in the past. Well, it hasn't. Cambridge produces the test and they have produced this test for about 30 years. They have a huge bank of test items and they compare these items, old items with new items and new items are being produced all the time. And they are compared to older ones and they are pre-tested. You may have done a pre-test. They are given to language schools and to other places. And they find out how well these questions perform, how hard they are for people, how easy they are for people. And the test is constructed so that there are some hard questions and some easy questions. And if perhaps one test is a little bit harder than another test, they will modify the scoring. In other words, if this test is seen to be a little bit harder, you might only need to get 29 answers correct to get your band seven. If this test is a little bit easier, you might have to get 32 correct answers to get your band seven. Do you see how it works? Cambridge is very careful in making sure that each test is this about the same level as every other test. And they have the statistics and they have the bank of items in order to ensure that. If, for example, you do a test one, one week and you do a, a test a few months later and you think that that test is harder, it may be a little bit harder for you, but the scoring, your ability to get a band six, seven, eight or nine is exactly the same. Okay, number eight. I have to do an IELTS preparation course in, a, in rather than a general English course. This is a very interesting question. I remember I, I was teaching English for a long time and teaching IELTS preparation for a long time. And I always thought that students in the IELTS preparation class could probably learn everything that they needed about IELTS in about a week or maybe a couple of days. The, the idea that you have to actually do 
a, a specific preparation course for IELTS is actually not true. And the reason it's not true is that IELTS is a very big test of English. Anything that you learn in English will help you get a good score in IELTS. It might be something that you've heard listening to a song. It might be something that you have read in a newspaper or a magazine. It might be something that you saw on a YouTube video. Now, the reason that IELTS is very respected throughout the world is that it is a true indication of your overall ability to understand and use English. That means any way that you learn English will help you in IELTS. And that means a general English course where you might learn a song, for example, or you might be looking at newspapers, or you might be just discussing things with uh, your friends is a good preparation for IELTS. But please do some IELTS specific preparation as well, because you want to know the type of questions, the, the time limits, you want to know the structure of the test, because that will help you too. Okay. Number nine, this really relates to what I just said about IELTS preparation. Some people think that the best way to get a good score in IELTS is to simply do a practice test every day, if not two. Now, this is not efficient learning. It's not efficient. It's not efficient because it's better to look at one test and understand the reading in there, to understand what you're listening to, to practice using that language, to take that language out into the street to your friends and practice using it. Doing all of these things will actually improve your level of English. Just doing a lot of practice tests won't necessarily improve your English. What I'm saying is less is more. Now, this is an English phrase, which is a beautiful one. Look at a practice test, yeah, but look at it for a week. Look at different parts of it, analyze it, take parts of it and use it, make it your own language. That is efficient learning. That's what I suggest. Okay. Number 10 of 19. No one has ever been able to achieve a band nine score on the IELTS test. Well, let me tell you, I know people who have. And in fact, I know people whose first language is not English and they have achieved a nine. In fact, one of these people, and I won't mention his name, is a good friend of mine and he became an IELTS examiner. That's a true story. So it's not impossible. A native speaker of English very often will get a nine for speaking and for reading and for listening. Sometimes they won't necessarily get a nine for writing because their punctuation is not very good or their spelling is not very good or they don't answer the question very fully. But nines are within your grasp if you keep working at your English. Number 11. The IELTS test is harder than other English proficiency tests. Well, for some people, it is. For some people, it's easier. It's another English phrase, horses for courses. Now, I could tell you a lot about horses. I could tell you a lot about courses. It just means that if you are a particular type of person, IELTS will suit you perfectly. If you are another sort of person, maybe it won't suit you as well. But that's the same for anything. The same for food, the same for music, you name it. The other thing to, to point out is that IELTS is a particular type of test that tries to 
score everybody from perfect English down to no English. That means it's attempting to place everyone who does the test on a scale. Now this means that some of the questions in IELTS must be quite hard. In other words, some of these questions are designed for someone who has perfect English. So if you're a band six or seven and you find this difficult question, relax. It's not for you. It's for that person who is a band nine. And that is the design of the test. Now, there are other tests where you simply pass or fail, which are level based. They're based on a level. They're aimed at someone who is a band five equivalent or someone who's a band seven equivalent. And you do a test like that and you won't get those difficult questions. You'll just get a pass or fail. Do you reach that level or not? So there are different types of tests and there are different types of people. So what can I say? If you find IELTS difficult, don't be discouraged, but realize that it's placing, it, it has a validity, a truth that has been established over 30 years. And the other thing about it is it's recognized around the world. So persevere with IELTS is my message to you. Number 12, I don't need to do the test ever again. Phew, once I've got the score that I need. Well, this may be true. You may never need to do the IELTS test once you get your band 6.5 or your seven or your eight. But as I just said, IELTS is used for every purpose that a, a language test can be used for. It's used for professional registra registration if you're a doctor or a nurse or an accountant. It's used for immigration purposes. It's used for entry into universities. It's used to show an employer your level of English. Any purpose that an English language test can serve, IELTS can serve. That means a score in IELTS is very valuable. And one day you may need to prove your English language level to someone you didn't imagine you would have to. You may need to register as an accountant or an engineer or something like that. And then you may need to do the IELTS test again. So my message really is keep practicing your English, keep learning because Learning a language is a lifetime mission. It's a project <clears throat> that finishes the day you die. I'm still learning English. Okay. This is a, a, a common misconception. This is a common myth. <clears throat> different countries offer different versions of the IELTS test. <clears throat> this is not true. The IELTS test, as I said before, is produced by Cambridge University. It has <clears throat> people in many different countries, Australia, the UK, America, producing content for that test. And it is delivered by IDP in some countries, by the British Council in other countries, by both organizations in other countries. And every time that an IELTS test is delivered, it is exactly the same, no matter what country. There are two versions of an IELTS test, <clears throat> academic and general training. But if you're doing an academic test in Australia, it's the same as the one in Uzbekistan. It's the same as the one in Vietnam. It's the same as the one in Turkey. If you're doing a general training, it's the same in any country. So you can be assured 
that it is always the same test. And I'll get on to the next one in a moment because this one's coming up. <clears throat> Number 14, I can only take the test once. Well, this is clearly not true because many people take it more than once. And it, in the past, a long time ago, you had to wait. You had to wait some time before you did the test a second or a third or a fourth time. But now you can do the test as many times as you like. Uh, and there is absolutely no limit to how many tests you can do. But I would point out that there is, there is no purpose in doing a test every day. It's wise to do one test, get your results, think about what you have to improve, work on your English, and then do a test. Now, this is what I was going to talk about before. I've heard this from many people. If I go back to Indonesia, I might get a better result rather than doing it in Australia. Or if I'm in Germany. Now, the reason that people think this, I think, is that sometimes they believe that if they are sitting the test where the level of English is high, then they will be marked lower. But if they are, if their level of English is high and they're doing it in a country where the general level of English is low, then that will improve their score. And this is not true. The test, as I said before, is always the same and it's always marked the same. And that means that if you are a band six in Australia, you will be a band six in Fiji, you will be a band six in Indonesia, you will be a band six in the UK or in Kazakhstan. There might be other factors. You might feel more comfortable at home. Your mother might be able to give you a beautiful breakfast before you do the test. So those things are true. But in as far as the test goes, it's always the same. Okay, number 16. I need a certain score to pass the IELTS test. Well, I've already touched on this before. The IELTS test tries to put a person on a level from one to nine, from no English, to perfect English. And different people have different targets. For some people, a band 4.5 is good because that will help them get a, uh, a working permit to work in an English speaking country in a job like chopping up meat or something like that. Not a, not a very skilled profession. But other people will need a six to get a student visa or into a university. Some people will need uh, a seven for their professional registration. Others will need an eight if they, uh, if they want registration as a teacher. So you can see there is no pass or fail in IELTS. There is simply a score which indicates your level. We're nearly finished. Wearing a face mask during my IELTS speaking test may affect my score. Well, I have some knowledge of this. My beard does not affect my score. And I wear a face mask a lot these days for obvious reasons. I can still make myself understood. It might be wise to speak a little more clearly or more loudly through your face mask. But really, think about it. Your speaking test, you are in a, in a quiet room, not too far away from the examiner. And really, the examiner can hear you, you can hear them. But the other thing about IELTS is, an IELTS speaking test, you can say to the examiner, who is wearing a mask, can you please speak up? And he or she can say to you, I'm sorry, 
could you speak up? Now, this is very, very useful because, as I said, the IELTS speaking test is an interaction between two human beings and everything that is possible, all sorts of communication that is possible between human beings is possible in an IELTS speaking test. Ask for clarification, ask for repetition, ask someone to speak up a little more loudly. So really, you shouldn't be worried about the face mask. Number 18, this myth. All I need to study abroad is an IELTS score. Well, this is an important point. You need to do some research and you need to go to an education agent. Now, I'm going to tell you to go to IDP, Student Services, not because I like IDP, but because IDP, well, I do, I, I do, but because it is one of the biggest education agents in the world with 40 offices throughout the world, and they will give you advice for free. So go to the student services office at IDP in your city. There will probably be one there. And say, what do I need to study abroad? I want to go to this country. I want to do this course. There may be other things. They'll tell you what IELTS score you require. They may tell you that you need to get a medical check. They may tell you that you need to have a certain amount of money in the bank as well. There are lots of different things that you will need to study abroad. But the IELTS test, of course, is an important part of that. And finally, myth number 19, the one I've been looking for. Marks are deducted in reading and listening if the answer is wrong. Now, some tests are like this. If you give the wrong answer, they'll take a mark off. This is not what we do in IELTS. My advice to you is to answer every question. Answer every question in the reading. Answer every question in the listening. Even if you don't know very much about the subject, write as much as you can. No, well, not as much as you can, but the right number of words in the writing. And speak as, as uh, fully as you can in the speaking test. In the reading and listening, sometimes you will get to question number 35 and you'll have one minute left. That means you have five questions to answer. Just guess. True, 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 true. That's what I would su suggest because you won't have a mark taken away and you might just get a couple of extra correct answers. That's okay. That's test taking skills 101. Okay, that is the end of the myths, Gemma, and I'm very happy now to take some questions if you have any. Thank you, Don, for helping us bust so many myths. Um, someone in the chat box has actually written, Don Oliver is brilliant. Now, is that an IELTS myth or is that true? Well, that's one of, that's, that's <laughs> well, look, if you ask my wife, you would get a different view, <laughs> but I think it's pretty close to the mark. No, thank you for answering all those questions tonight. We've had a lot more come in. Um, alrighty, so let's go straight into it. Um, someone's written, Don, I'm an IELTS coach and recently I felt that some of my test takers are scoring 6.5 in their writing. When they used to score higher, what do you think of this? Uh, well, as I said before, the test has not got harder. Um, the writing uh, is always marked by two people who do not know uh, what the other uh, is giving, what score they're giving. It's uh, the, the markers will not know uh, the purpose or the nationality uh, or the, or the, the uh, sex of the candidate either. In uh, all of the things that we can possibly do to make it as objective as, as we can, we do. And the markers are using the same assessment criteria that they have used for many years. Uh, that has not changed either. The interpretation has not really changed uh, either. 
And so there is no reason why uh, a person should get a lower mark than they did before. So um, this is, a, I think I'm going to, if, I think this is a myth, this one. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks for clarifying that one. All right, here's a really good question. According to the band descriptors, less common words should be used in writing. Do less common words mean difficult words? Well, a difficult word for um, one person is not a difficult word for another person. So I don't think we should use the word difficult. The, um, as, as your um, questioner uh, said, the word uncommon is used in the assessment criteria. And so uh, it, it really just means a word that is, we, we use the, free, the, the word low frequency. It's not a word that you hear every day on the TV or uh, at the supermarket. Uh, but it doesn't have to be a very complicated or difficult word or a long word, no. Um, I'm trying to think of a word like, um, a word like uh, infrastructure, for example, or amenities. If we're talking about, um, if we're writing a piece about cities and the development of cities, we might talk about things like that. Um, uh, but uh, we might talk about urban transport, we might talk about um, uh, uh, people who commute. Now, those words are not particularly uh, difficult, but they are less common than words like go or buildings or something mm. like that. So really, um, I can't give a proper answer to that, but uh, my message probably would be make vocabulary building a part of your regime. And that means always keep a, a, a booklet of new words, how to use them, words in a sentence, and revise them continually, know how to spell them and use them. And the more you use these words, in fact, the less difficult they will become, the less uncommon they will become, and the better you will um, do in your writing and speaking. That's a really great tip. Now, here's an interesting question as well. We get a lot of questions about whether it's appropriate to write um, tests all in capital letters, but this person has asked, can they use capital letters in the computer-based test? Um, that is a very, very good mm. question. Mm. Um, uh, look, I'll have to, uh, in the writing, in the pencil and paper test, they can. There's no mm -hmm. problem with that. And in fact, I would recommend someone whose writing is not very clear to use capital letter, letters, all capital. And I am assuming that it's exactly the same for the computer delivered test. Do you know, Gemma? Can you help me with this one? I, I don't know. We might need to clarify this one in the mm. comments later on. Yeah, I think maybe we could put uh, uh, some clarification out. But my first instinct is to say that it, the computer test is exactly the same as the pencil and paper test uh, in, in virtually every respect, apart from being delivered on a computer. So I would assume that all capital letters are OK on the computer test as well. Great, we will follow that one up though, and we'll leave a comment um, in the Facebook video uh, for this. Um, alrighty, someone has asked, what will happen if I type more than 300 words in the writing task? Um, the examiner will read every word um, and uh, there's no problem. Um, but if you write 300 words, that's probably the upper limit, I think, mm -hmm. because for the simple reason, the more words you write, the more opportunity there is for you to make a mistake, the less focus you will probably have on answering the question directly and the less time you will have to check your work. So for those three reasons, I would suggest that you limit your task two writing to about 260, 270 words and your task one to about 160, 170. Because the more you write, the more chance there is to make a mistake, the less time you have to check your work. Good tip. And if you take the computer delivered test, uh, you can see your how many words you've written in the automatic word count, which is really That's helpful. Right. Yep. Okay, here's another great question. So how do I write the date and the year in the test? Is it the 13th of September um, with the TH or just 1-3 September or September 13th, for example? Yep. Yep, 
Uh, there are many conventions uh, for writing uh, dates. Uh, there's, there are American conventions, there are British conventions, uh, there are the, the eight or just eight. Um, if you use any convention, which is normal, uh, any of the many conventions, that's okay. Uh, the only problem is if it is an odd way of doing it, which is confusing. Mm. So if you if you make up your own convention, don't do that. Just stick to one convention and it will be marked correct. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Alrighty, another question we've got uh, that, that's coming here that's similar to um, if you smile in the speaking test, will you get better points? So someone has said, um, someone's been advised that eye contact is important during the speaking test. However, there is no criteria in the band descriptors for this. Can you please clarify? Yep. The examiner is asked to keep eye contact. The examiner, and, and it's because, as I said, the speaking test is two human beings interacting as human beings do. And the examiner is asked to, sh to indicate, to show their interest and their engagement. And so eye contact is an important part of that. Now, if you are very shy, for example, and you don't like eye contact, or if culturally it, it's a, a, a strange thing to do, not a problem, because the examiner is not making any assessment on your body language, on your eye contact, as your questioner says. The assessment criteria are quite clear. They are all linguistic. They are all about how you use the language. So whether you keep eye contact or not, doesn't matter, but the examiner will attempt to keep eye contact. Great, thanks for clarifying that one. Alrighty, staying on the speaking test, someone has asked if I use uh, gap fillers in the speaking test, will it affect my score? Uh, it depends what the gap filler is mm -hmm. and how often you use them. Uh, look, uh, a young native speaker of English will overuse particular words like like, mm -hmm. right? He was like, like, you know, like. Uh, overusing one is not a very good, uh, is not a good indication of your level of English. So gap fillers are, are good because they give you some chance, a opportunity to think, and they can increase your fluency. They can fill up the, um, the pauses. Uh, but think about interesting ways to fill up a gap. Mm, that's interesting. Um, I'm not sure. Let me think. Oh, well, I suppose all of these things are perfectly good and they indicate to the examiner that you actually have all of these words, different words that you can use appropriately. So practice your gap fillers and have a range of them. My favourite gap filler is, ah, thanks for clarifying, Don, as I, <laughs> as I try and figure out the next question to answer, ask you. Yeah, no, you're All great. Right. You're band nine. Thanks for clarifying that, Don. All righty, next question is, can you talk about some of the main differences between the academic and the general training test? Yes. Well, first of all, I'll talk about where there is no difference. There is no difference in the speaking and there is no difference in the listening. So in, for those two skills, the tests are exactly the same. In the writing, the task one writing is different in general training compared to academic. In general training, task one is writing a letter. In task one in academic, the task is describing some visual data, a graph perhaps. In the reading, the academic reading is three passages of uh, about 900 words each, about 2,500 2, words in total. And they have not, an ac not that academic, but things of general interest. Uh, in the general training reading, there might be six different sections um, that are shorter, but the total words are much the same as the academic. And the, and the reading that you have to do in the general training <laughs> will be about things like 
uh, jobs or about everyday life. It might be advertisements or something like that. <clears throat> Could be a list of rules that you have to read and answer questions about. So the focus in the academic reading is a, a little bit more academic and longer texts. The focus in the general training is less academic, more about work and things like that and shorter texts. And they are the differences. Lovely, thanks for that explanation. Okay, so we're almost at time, but we'll just take uh, one more question. So someone has asked here, um, I'm taking the paper-based test. Uh, what's the best tips uh, to count my words so it won't take too long and be too stressful? Yeah, um, well, if you've written, uh, and I'm sure this person has done some practice mm -hmm. tests, and they should know that their 250 words <coughs> amounts to something like, I don't know, something like... Um, 25 lines, uh, uh, yeah, so something like 10 words in a line. Well, if they get to 25 lines, they can be pretty confident that they have written enough. So <clears throat> they don't have to count every word. Um, they have to be just approximately there. So I wouldn't worry too much about length. Uh, if they've practiced writing 250 words for task two, 150 words for task one, they should have a pretty fair idea of whether they're around that mark. So I, that, I wouldn't even waste time counting every word. Great, thanks for that tip. Alrighty, Don, we might um, wrap it up there tonight. You have answered a lot of questions for us. So thank you so much for that. My pleasure. Um, I will do a shout out for our next um, webinar. Don is taking a much deserved break. Uh, so our next webinar will be on Thursday, the 22nd of October. It will be an IELTS speaking masterclass with another IELTS expert, um, Tina, she will be joining us. Um, if you missed uh, any part of this webinar, you can watch it again on uh, Facebook. And um, if we haven't answered your questions, Dave, we'll try and get round to them in the comments. So thanks again, Don, for joining us. Enjoy a break for the moment. We Thank hope you. to have you back soon. Okay, Bye -bye. thanks Gemma. Bye-bye everybody. Everyone. Bye.